Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Leon Sindikfumana. I'm the chair of the economics department. This is our big day where we celebrate our, uh, the achievements from our brilliant and innovative entrepreneurial undergrad students. Um, we have a number of events which are scheduled today. Uh, one is this, uh, this debate, but there's also an exhibition for uh, the service learning community service learning uh, project next door. Uh, downstairs there is uh, economic undergra undergraduate research assistant uh, pro pro uh, program where the students are showing off their research. And then um, this evening uh, we'll have uh, uh, presentations for the, on the cooperatives enter enterprise pro program uh, where students are going to, sh to show what they have done. They will, some, some of them will get their certificates. And we'll have awards, different awards, scholarships for all kinds of achievements, which will be given in this room after the, after the debate. Um, so I'm going to cut, try to cut short my long speech. <laughs> no, I don't have a speech. <laughs> Except welcoming you and thanking all those who have, who have traveled from, uh, from far away, not far away, to come to attend this, uh, this event. But let me first thank Michael and his team for Michael the the director of the undergrad program and his team, Sheila, who I don't know what will happen in this house if she wasn't there. Uh, then uh, uh, Valerie, chief undergraduate economic advisor and her team, I see Leah, I see um, others are not here. And I want to thank our dean for coming to John to, to, to watch. Um, then I want to thank the judges who how do, we, how do you do a debate without judges? <laughs> Thank you very much for taking your time to come, James, Stephen, and Bill. Um, then uh, thanks to the debaters for take, make, having the courage to come and actually convince to us that all the sides are correct. <laughs> I, I wish the good luck to the judges who have to find a winner. Um, then let me just introduce the moderator Antonia Morini, and she's going to tell us how the debate is going to go and the rules of the game. Thank you. Oh, you know, I forgot the biggest part of the day, the barbecue. <laughs> it's at 4.30. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Antonia Morini. I'm a senior here, um, economics student. Um, the topic this year is, should universal basic income be implemented in the United States? So the procedure is as follows. There's 15 minutes for opening statements for each side, um, five minute break, then 16 minutes of back and forth with two rounds um, of four minutes for each team, um, then another five minute break, um, 10 minutes for Q&A from the judges, um, and then five minutes each for closing statements. Um, then the judges will deliberate and decide on the winner. Um, our judges are Bill Troy, Stephen Clark, and James Santucci. Um, we have the affirmative over here, if you guys want to introduce yourselves really quick. My name's Victoria, I'm a junior economics major. I'm Sophia, I'm the sophomore economics and political science major. I'm Fatima Dari, I'm a freshman economics major. I'm Carl Walsh, I'm a junior finance and economics major. And the negative? Alrighty, we can begin. Affirmative, if you want to start. In 2016, 40.6 million people in the United States lived in poverty. In the same year, 21.2% of all children, or 15.3 million kids in the U.S. lived in poverty. That's almost one in every five children. 29.8% of the population, or 95 million people, live close to poverty, with incomes less than two times that of their poverty thresholds. And what's worse is that 6.7% of the population, or 21.3 million people, live in deep poverty, with incomes below 15% of their poverty thresholds. 
Wealth and income inequality has been steadily increasing in the United States for the past five decades, with the top 1% of income earners doubling their share of national income in that time span. Today, the top 1% of Americans make 39 times the income of the bottom 99% on average. The economic growth of high-income countries is making the rich richer, but having very little effect on the working classes. The research of economists Emmanuel Saez and Thomas Piketty showed that, and I quote, the bottom half of earners went from making 20% of overall income in 1979 to just 13% in 2014. The top 1%, on the other hand, have gone from making 11% to 20%. The pie has gotten vastly bigger, and the richest families have reaped bigger and bigger pieces from it. The hard truth is that people in this country are struggling to maintain a decent standard of living. The United States currently has a wide range of welfare programs that are supposedly anti-poverty, but let's take a look at the facts. TANF is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program. Only 23% of families living in poverty receive temporary assistance for needy families cash assistance in the United States. The Earned Income Tax Credit is a tax credit for families with at least one child. For the tax year of 2018, a family of four in which couples are married and fi filing jointly must earn less than $51,492 a year to qualify. Unfortunately, almost one-fourth of the payments are in error and there is an unknown fraudulent amount. Lastly, the Great Recession happened over a decade ago, and though the massively wealthy made a swift recovery, many Americans are still seeing the crippling effects of the crisis due to the failure of welfare programs. Despite doubled unemployment rates during that time, the number of families receiving assistance grew by only 13%. So there is clearly a pattern of failures when it comes to these welfare programs. As we see it, there is one clear solution to end the inconsistency of poverty alleviation measures in this country and also help to overcome the extreme wealth disparities that exist within it, and that is the Universal Basic Income, or UBI. Universal basic income is a form of social program that guarantees a certain amount of money to every citizen within a given governed population without having to pass a test or fulfill a work requirement. Every universal basic income plan can be different in terms of amount or design. It is a plan to streamline the current social services programs, like welfare and social security, into one single cash payment, using the existing funding for those programs, as well as other measures, like progressive taxes on the wealthy and increased taxes on corporations to fund a basic income which raises the yearly earnings of low-income Americans. Okay, hi. Um, so there are many reasons to adopt UBI as a measure in the United States of America. First off, UBI reduces bureaucratic costs. With no strings attached coverage, determining who is eligible is far simpler, and the cost of administering benefits is greatly reduced. A simple cash payment would cut down on bureaucracy. It would replace housing vouchers, food stamps, and other programs. The simplicity of a program means it would also cost the governments less. Conservative Utah Senator Mike Lee told the Heritage Foundation, there is no reason the federal government should maintain 79 different means-tested programs. To elaborate, according to an article by ABC News in 1998, nearly 60% of welfare spending was on cash benefits, categorized as basic assistance. By 2014, it was only about one quarter of temporary assistance for needy families spending, as a bulk of the money went into administrative costs and spending towards the numerous other welfare programs the state issues, many of which are biased towards people without jobs. UBI increases bargaining power for workers because a guaranteed unconditional income gives them leverage to say no to exploitative wages and abusive working conditions. Employers can't push workers around as much. This results in better mental health conditions for the recipients because it reduces conditions of scarcity, poverty, and financial insecurity, major sources of stress for millions of people. Another big shift that the world has seen is the advent of globalization and with it increased technologies in automation and artificial intelligence. This has shrunk the job market drastically, resulting in rampant unemployment. With advanced technology taking over more and more blue and white collar jobs, UBI would act as a sort of security net for the millions of people who will be left jobless by the tech revolution. Research shows that the longer you are unemployed, the longer it takes you to find employment. If the jobless had a small source of income to help them back on their feet, they could find new jobs and start contributing to the economy sooner. 
In 2018, Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes outlined his plan in his book, Fair Shot. He argues that U.S. workers, students, and caregivers making $50,000 or less a year should receive a guaranteed income of $500 a month. He said automation and globalization have destroyed the employment market. It's created a lot of part-time, contract, and temporary jobs. But these positions just aren't enough to provide a decent standard of living. Cash is the best thing you can do to improve health outcomes, education outcomes, and lift people out of poverty, Hughes said. Hughes's guaranteed income is financed by taxes on the top 1%. It would work through a modernization of earned income tax credit. To Hughes, it's the only solution to an economy where a small group of people are getting very, very wealthy while everyone else is struggling to make ends meet. That segues into the second reason that UBI should be implemented. It actually encourages people to find work contrary to what many anti-UBI advocates believe. Many current welfare programs take away benefits when recipients find work, sometimes leaving them financially worse off than before they were employed. UBI is for lower income adults, regardless of employment, st employment status, so recipients are free to seek additional income, which most everyone does. The Roosevelt Institute found that a UBI would generate 4.6 million jobs and grow the economy by 12% continuously. UBI would be a catalyst for new jobs, entrepreneurship, and innovation. In fact, welfare isn't just a moral imperative to raise the living standards of the poor. It is also a crucial investment in the health and future careers of low-income kids. Today, the average UMass student is estimated to graduate with an average of $30,000 in debt. A result of this is that many students, despite government welfare schemes such as the Pell Grant, drop out of college before graduating. A simple cash payment, as per the proposal, for UPI has the potential to significantly reduce this problem. Take for example the striking finding from a new research paper from researchers at Georgetown University and the University of Chicago. They analyzed a Mexican program called Prospera, the world, world's first conditional cash transfer system, which provides money to poor families on the condition that they send their children to school and stay up to date on vac vaccinations and doctor's visits. In 2016, Prospera offered cash assistance to nearly 7 million Mexican households. In the paper, researchers matched up data from Prospera with data about households' incomes to analyze for the first time the program's effect on children several decades after they started receiving benefits. The researchers found that the typical young person exposed to the program for seven years ultimately completed three more years of education and was 37% more likely to be employed. That's not all. Young Prospera beneficiaries grew up to become adults who worked, on average, nine more hours each week than similarly poor children who weren't enro enrolled in the program. They also earned higher hourly wages. There are many other successful examples of systems that rely on direct cash payments to uplift those living under the poverty level. These include Finland, where in 2017 they began a two-year experiment. It gave 2,000 unemployed people 560 euros, or around $625, a month for two years, even if they found work. The recipients said it reduced stress. It also gave them more incentive to find a good job or start their own business. In 2010, the government of Iran ran a UBI trial, giving citizens transfers of 29% of the medium income each month. Poverty and inequality were reduced, and there was no sign of large amounts of people leaving the labor market. In fact, people used it to invest in their businesses, encouraging the growth of small enterprises. A UBI trial in Manitoba, Canada showed a modest reduction in workers along with fewer hospitalizations and mental health diagnoses. Closer to home are Hawaii and Alaska. Alaska has had a guaranteed income program since 1982. It is called the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend. The preference for keeping the PFD was strongest among those with annual household incomes under $50,000 and those who described their situations as barely surviving. Even these respondents with household incomes over $100,000 tended to prefer that the income taxes be raised than the permanent dividend fund be terminated. There is evidently great public support in the state of Alaska for this program. As it turns out, the overall public support for UBI in the United States of America has also increased drastically over the last decade. A poll conducted 10 years ago showed that public support of UBI was only at 12%. A Gallup poll conducted in 2017 showed that support for UBI is now up to 48%, meaning that support for UBI has quadrupled over the past decade.
Implementation of a UBI has countless possibilities. Attacks on automation is one of the most beneficial and viable options. Automation is increasing at an accelerating pace and threatening low-skill labor. In 2017, PricewaterhouseCoopers estimated 38% of U.S. jobs will be in danger of being replaced by automation by 2030. Automation's disruption will disproportionately affect low-wage earners because of the routine nature of most of their labor. Automation is extremely lucrative for many industries because it is operationally more efficient than labor and the cost of robotics and technology is decreasing. The Boston Consulting Group estimates the cost of robotics, hardware, and software has decreased about 40% over the past decade. This is allowing organizations to substitute robotics for labor and reap considerable benefits. It seems only just that these organizations benefiting from displacing these laborers offer some compensation to those suffering from structural unemployment. One method of accomplishing this is through a sliding scale automation tax. A sliding scale automation tax would tax organization at, organizations at varying degrees depending on how many human workers the organization is employing compared to how many robots it has performing tasks humans would otherwise perform. Another avenue for funding for a UBI would be a wealth tax. There has been increasing wealth inequality in America. As in 2019, inequality.org reported Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett combined own significantly more than the bottom 50% of Americans. While these individuals and other high-wage owners are certainly accomplished, they benefited from the discoveries and advancements of generations before them. As a result, it seems only fair that these individuals and other wealthy Americans return some of their earnings to society, which helped them become who they are. In a Jacobin article, article US professor, UMass professor Robert Poland estimated a wealth tax of around 0.4% would raise about $2 billion, $200 billion. This is a bit below some of the estimates for UBI costs, but it is a modest tax that will not greatly affect those with such a, high marginal util, uh, such a low marginal utility of wealth. Finally, this, is, this, re, this, redistribution, this redistributes money from those who do not need it as much to those who need it more. Another method of funding UB, for funding a UBI is through a tax on carbon. In 2019, the United States had the second most carbon dioxide emissions globally, only lagging China. Additionally, its 2007 per capita carbon dioxide emissions were also very high relative to other countries. Global carbon dioxide emissions increased from 2017 to 2018 and are expected to increase again from 2018 to 2019. The current rate of fossil fuel consumption is unsustainable, and unless action is taken to reduce these carbon dioxide emissions, the world may face irreversible consequences. Since it appears industry and other fossil fuel emitters are not motivated by the present climate crisis to adjust their behavior, a carbon tax may provide the proper incentive for them to do so. Since the environmental degradation is a negative externality shouldered by the entire globe, it is reasonable for the proceeds from these taxes to be returned to the entire U.S. population as a rebate. This Pigovian tax corrects the market failure by internalizing the cost of climate degradation with various actions, but it also benefits those in greatest need of additional funds. Even if the tax is passed on to consumers initially, as industries attempt to shift, more sustain shift to more sustainable practices, the net benefit of the tax to those in the bottom 70% of the population will be material, according to Scott Santons. Essentially, what these individuals pay in increased taxes will uh, not offset the rebate received. Uh, one final feasible ma means of funding a UBI is to reduce the spending on existing well social welfare programs. This may appear counterproductive, but it will pr severely reduce many of the bureaucratic costs associated with operating in excess of programs. Furthermore, cash is the most liquid asset, as these individuals will be able to spend it however they believe it will benefit them best. Social welfare programs will still exist with a UBI, but beneficiaries of certain programs will see their benefits reduced by an amount equivalent to the income payments received through UBI. All of these methods of funding a UBI are reasonable and do not directly counteract the original purpose of a UBI. Uh, good afternoon. I am here to argue against the idea of universal basic income. Universal basic income is an idea that exists in the most idealistic world, but in reality it's not a feasible option. The idea of receiving free money from the government is something that sounds very appealing to most. However, nothing in life is actually free. Famed economist Milton Friedman once said, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and I think that phrase is very applicable to the idea of UBI. The wealth gap in our country and the number of low-income individuals is very clearly an issue that needs to be resolved, but UBI is not the way to do so. UBI is a cash payment to every citizen without any means testing program or work requirement. This means that multi-billionaires like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos are going to be receiving the same UBI 
that an unemployed or minimum wage worker is set to receive. So how does that make, make much sense? The universal aspect of UBI is also a major issue. If we are so worried about the wealth gap, why are we just increasing it by giving the wealthy more and more money? Why, why would we replace the current welfare programs in this country with UBI when the welfare programs are specifically to cater to the lower income individuals? Think of a single mother who relies on her welfare benefits to assist her in rent, food stamps, health care. She will actually be losing money when the UBI is implemented. She will not be receiving nearly as much money that she needs to get by and help her in her day-to-day -day life. The United States needs to keep their attention on improving and maintaining welfare programs in order to improve the lives of these struggling lower income individuals, rather than spread money across all income levels, which doesn't really do much to boost the lower income out of the situations that they are in. Now let's turn our attention to the financial aspect of this. How are we going to pay for the UBI? UBI will be a very expensive undertaking for this country. And the UBI proposal by presidential candidate Andrew Yang has made, he stated that each citizen would, would, would receive $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 a year each. And that would be totally um, $2.5 trillion annually. $2.5 trillion is an astounding number and it's one eighth of our total GDP. Now you may wonder where the money is going to be coming from and the answer is the taxpayers. Taxes for everyone will increase substantially. This would lead to a regressive taxation because it would not only be taxing the wealthy, but it would also um, tax the lower income individuals who can barely get by as, as it is. Even with this tax increase, it's still not exactly enough money to, play, to pay for the UBI initiative. Also, $1,000 a month is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. The basic standard of living prices vary from state to state. In many states, $1,000 is not enough to cover the cost of someone's rent. When you think of people who are living in cities like Boston, a two-bedroom apartment is well over $1,000 a month. So the UBI doesn't really do much to help them. Again, think back on that single mother of three and how is she supposed to manage to pay her rent, her groceries, and meet the basic standards of needs that her children have with only $1,000 a month. The finances of the UBI are not feasible in our country, and even if we did find a way to raise the money, it does not really um, benefit the lower income individuals who desperately need the government assistance in a more substantial way. If the UBI was implemented, the actual allocation of money is another major issue that, you ne that needs to be tackled. Um, the census is usually conducted to count the number of people living in this country, which is what would be used to see who's eligible for the UBI. However, the census is done um, every 10 years and it tends to be inaccurate and doesn't actually account for everyone in this country. Think of the number of homeless people and how are, and how are they expected to get their cash from the UBI when they're not even counted in the census most of the time. The design of the UBI leaves a lot of room for error, and this major error is, is that the most vulnerable population um, will face the most barriers to receiving the month to cash each month. Also, the actual distribution of the money each month will be a costly process as it is, and will hard to be impl implemented by each by state. I think there's a lot of logistical issues here that most people don't think about when they hear about the UBI, and they should be really taken into account more when it's being debated. Overall, the UBI is not the solution our country needs when it comes to solving the issue of wealth inequality and unemployment. Government programs are safety nets that are meant to help people that need it the most. People who have lost a job, been laid off, people with disabilities, single mothers, low-income households, or children of those households, and the elderly. A good safety net addresses the needs of these people and gives them financial help or services that they really need. That's why, as we've discussed, one of the biggest flaws with the universal basic income is the universal aspect of it. The United States already has programs that target these people to give them assistance in the things that they need. These programs are far from perfect and could definitely use improvement. But that doesn't mean that a universal basic income is the way to go about fixing them. If we decide to exchange our current system for one that my opponents propose, we would not only be diluting the funds that currently go towards those that need it, but we would be getting rid of the systems that help people get back in the job market. The ultimate goal of a safety net is to catch someone when they fall so they can get back up and become self-sufficient yet again. This way, the people that are able to work can go back into the workforce and contribute back into the economy. Means testing programs like unemployment insurance, the earned income tax credit, job training programs, and Pell Grants give Americans the ability to enter or re-enter the job market with a little bit of a cushion and possible training in a new field. A universal basic income 
just doesn't do this to the extent that the welfare system can. In the case of a UBI, a person who loses their job will still continue to receive their checks every month, but that's all they're going to get. In a system that is universal, people get no additional assistance because of unfortunate circumstances. There are no variations that meet people's needs. In a macroeconomic sense, UBIs are very rigid by nature and have a tough time responding to changes in the economy. Any changes made to the benefits would have to go to everybody, making it very tough for the government to react during an event like a recession. A paper called The Great Recession and the Social Safety Net recorded the response that our current welfare system had during the 2008 recession. The author found that the, the, the amount of spending that these programs conducted actually greatly increased during the recession by about $500 billion. Most of the increased spending came from the natural reactions of the EITC, unemployment insurance, and food stamp programs took during the, during, due to the increase in eligibility of people. Some of the boost, however, came from the legislation that eased restrictions and duration of support of unemployment insurance. This goes to show how important safety nets are to quickly, safety nets to, be, how important it is for safety nets to be able to quickly adapt to changes. And without systems we, like the ones we have in place, there would have been a lot more people that have not been able to recover like they did during the recession. If a UBI was in place during those circumstances, there would have been hardly any room for a good recovery that targeted the unemployed or the people falling into poverty. In fact, the universal aspect is at the heart of a UBI holds it back from being able to do what we would need it to do. These means testing programs that I've been talking about do require a bit of oversight and can at times go a bit too far. But I'm not saying, and I'm not saying that they're perfect. They could definitely use improvement but they are essential to make sure that the government can remain flexible, target the groups that need it, and, and need it the most. A UBI may seem very appealing, but it's not the solution that America needs or the people that need it the most, <laughs> that need financial support the most. Okay, you now get um, five minutes to deliberate your rebuttals, and then after it goes four minutes for you, four minutes for you, and then four minutes for you, and four minutes for you. It goes back and forth. Alrighty, time is up. You guys can start if you want. There are a lot of problems with America's current welfare system. People fall through its cracks. They have difficulty finding out which programs they're eligible for and experience shame and stigma for being on welfare. Some programs even require participants to have essentially zero assets in order to qualify. In effect, these programs kick in when people have hit rock bottom, rather than trying to prevent them from getting there in the first place. A universal basic income program would better assist low-income families by continuing to provide support even after people find work or begin to rise above poverty level. There are many proposed models of UBI. Many target only citizens who are 18 plus and make under a certain amount of money. Although in Alaska, the UBI has been successful since 1982 and has gone to everyone regardless of income. Many anti-UBI advocates question the impact that UBI would have on the economy. The claim is that implementation of the UBI will lead to inflation and have damaging effects on the economy. However, according to a comprehensive study issued by the Roosevelt Institute, which, which used the Levy Institute macroeconomic model to issue its findings, UBI is actually really beneficial to the economy. Researchers from the Roosevelt Institute created three models for U.S. implementation of UBI and found that under all scenarios, UBI would grow the economy, increasing output, unemployment prices, increasing output, employment prices, and wages. Overall, they find that the economy can not only withstand large increases in federal spending, but also grow thanks to the stimulative effects of cash transfers on the economy. The Levy model and the results it offers us about the macroeconomic effect of a UBI is situated in a larger world view that there is a lot of room to grow in our economy. Crucially, this is a Keynesian view, assuming that total spending is what determines economic output. As such, the model holds that policies would increase total spending, like UBI, would grow the economy. The model takes two crucial things into account. First, unconditional cash transfers do not mean that people will stop working, which surveying extensive empirical evidence demonstrates. Second, the paper takes seriously the idea that when the government takes away an additional dollar of a rich household's income through taxes, the household doesn't respond by dropping out of the labor force. Instead, each marginal dollar taxed away for reduces rich households' incentives to bargain for a larger share of the economic pie. The belief about this bargaining elasticity derives from the work 
by Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, and Stephanie Duncheva. This means that high progressive tax rates could have a very positive effect on reducing inequality without harming growth. Experiments with unconditional cash benefits around the world have proven to be one of the most successful ways of reducing poverty. The fear that cash recipients would waste their money on drugs or alcohol, stop working, or have more kids have been disproven by the World Bank. Many of these behaviors were actually reduced. The guarantee of UBI protects people from sluggish wage growth, low wages, and the lack of job security caused by the effects of the growing gig economy such as Uber Lyft driving, short-term contracts, and increased automation in the workplace. UBIs also enable people to stay in school longer and participate in training to improve skills or learn a trade. All in all, we believe that UBI has the potential to significantly alter the lives of many low-income households in this country, affect our economy positively, and also balance wealth inequality in an effective and feasible way. UBI could be shaped by U.S. policymakers in order to be successful in our uh, country. This is essentially a discussion that has to be had because welfare programs are not operating uh, properly currently. Hello. So my opposing team brought up the Roosevelt Institute, which did use the levy economic or macroeconomic model. This model only looks at aggregate demand output, and it makes the assumption that aggregate demand output will increase employment, um, job numbers, and personally on that level, although it does not measure for it. In these studies, they admitted within the introduction in the paper that they do suffer from external validity within their data. They're not measuring a a actual universal basic income. They're just showing that cash handouts do not discourage working, which we don't argue with. Um, that is not what we are disagreeing with. Our um, argument is based around the fact that universal basic income will not help inequality. The jump to conclusion that increase in aggregate demand is in a decrease in inequality is a far reach. Also, the assumptions that that model makes are a little hard to believe. The assumptions that um, that employment, labor force, participation, price, and wages will grow go up as aggregate demand grows up is um, not found to be true. And if we're only looking at aggregate demand as being the best um, Thank you, indicator for our country. We see here in GDP, our aggregate demand, our GDP has been going up for a while. And we've had a, um, a bump in the road during the Great Recession, but we've well recovered from that. It does not address the inequality. Now, as they stated in their introduction, one reason for implementing a universal basic income is a threat of automation. And some people say that this is the time of the greatest technological advancement in history, which I don't believe it is. I know we are gathering more um, resources and uh, in, uh, inventions faster and faster, but that does not mean that we as people will cripple to robots so easily. All throughout history, when jobs have been replaced by machines, we have created new jobs. And if we look, we have not had um, a slowdown of job creation. There's still been an increase in jobs. So the threat that automation will replace jobs is not um, valid. Also, there have been a lot of studies that show the history of automation and employment. Um, with the introduction of ATMs, one would think that this automation of the teller would lead to a decrease in the number of bank tellers. But it actually rose the number of, of tellers of people, employers, because it became cheaper to operate those banks that they open more banks. You see, we're able to create jobs 
and evolve our situations. And the UBI does not, is, is a early solution to a threat that is not here, nor does it really solve the problem of inequality. Um, hi. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, we don't have a presentation, but there are a couple of things that we're going to address. Um, first of all, in your introduction, um, um, my or in their introduction, my opponent said um, that the money for a system like UBI would come from taxing everyone. Um, most UBI proposals do not include taxations for everyone. Um, progressive taxation here is the key. Um, and I also noticed that you men mentioned Milton Friedman, um, but. Uh, he is actually very famously pro-UBI in his book, Capitalism and Freedom. He very famously said that negative income tax is the way to implement UBI, and um, he's always been in favor of that. The other thing that you brought up was Andrew Yang's proposal. Um, Andrew Yang not only um, advocates for UBI, he also uh, um, outlines a very comprehensive proposal for the same. Um, so. In answer to the argument that UBI is universal and that means that even the rich are going to be getting money, um, the reason that we are giving UBI to everyone is, um, I'll read out from Andrew Yang's proposal. Um, it says that by giving everyone UBI, the stigma for accepting cash transfers from the government disappears. Additionally, and this is key here, it removes the incentive for anyone to remain within certain income brackets to receive benefits, which is exactly what the welfare plans right now are doing. If it's paid for by a value-added tax, as Andrew Yang advocates for, a wealthy person will likely pay more into the system than he or she gets out to it. So um, yes, um, UBI, like there are many proposals for UBI, but some of the proposals that you outlined yourself are actually very comprehensive in their approach um, into how to pay for it and why it's important that everyone gets a share of the pie because we are seeing increasing levels of wealth inequality. Um, I also noticed that in your presentation, you used um, GDP. Um, I think that one of the one of the biggest flaws with using GDP as a measure to actually, um, you know, or use, using GDP to measure welfare is flawed in itself because, um, like, this is pers personal experience. My f the first thing that we, I was taught in my macroeconomics class is that GDP cannot act as an adequate measure for welfare, and that's for a couple of reasons. It does not account for um, distributional inequalities. It does not account for negative externalities. It's a very linear measure that that does not account for a lot of different things. Um, and the fact is that, yes, employment has steadily risen, but despite there being a steady rise in employment, there is still um, there are still certain groups and communities in our society who are not able to have access to this, uh, to this um, employment, which only further um, uh, um, which only further points to the fact that there is structural inequality and structural employment traps um, where we are. So um, while I acknowledge that there has been a steady increase, at the same time, um, there are people without jobs, and that's something that must be addressed, and that's not something that the current welfare programs are able to address. Thank you. So as far as uh, Andrew Yang's plan goes, um, he's arguing for, as you said, a value-added tax. Um, so while it may be true that uh, higher income earners will be paying more with this kind of tax, I think it's more important to think about what uh, percentage of their income they'll be paying, which, really, which with that kind of tax will actually put more of a burden on lower income earners. Um, there's a lot of arguments against our current welfare system, and it's true that the system has problems, but UBI really isn't the solution to those problems. You know, it's uh, the simplicity that comes with UBI that might make it so appealing 
is kind of where it has issues, you know. Uh, why are we giving money to Bill Gates and to Jeff Bezos and like the our welfare programs don't have to be universal and they don't have to be going to everyone. Um, I think the argument that it's going to reduce the stigma or that against getting cash from the government that feels weak to me. Uh, I don't think people will not want to get benefits from the government just because, you know, super rich people don't also get them. Um, one thing that hasn't been addressed is how this system is actually going to be implemented. Um, it's a huge logistical challenge to decide to give everyone in the country $1,000 a month. How are we going to actually deliver these services? Um, for example, uh, it's estimated that the uh, upcoming 2020 census is going to cost $15.9 billion. Um, basically what this means, or basically the reason for this is because finding and counting everyone in the country is a very difficult thing to do. It's going to be equally difficult to find and give everyone these universal benefits. And often these people who are hardest to find and hardest to get in contact with are going to be the people who need these benefits the most. So either this is going to mean the system is very costly, or it's going to mean that the people who need our help the most are the ones who aren't going to get it. Um, you pointed out uh, the Alaska uh, program, and the Alaska the Alaska UBI program is paid for by oil revenues. Um, that's just not available to everyone. Um, we won't be able to. We're going to have to find other ways to pay for it. Um, some, some of which you proposed. Uh, one proposal for paying for it uh, that you came up with was uh, carbon taxes. Um, we would argue that carbon tax revenue should really go to helping solve the challenge of climate change um, rather than paying for this totally separate uh, program. Uh, finally, uh, one thing you mentioned, it's in Andrew Yang's plan, and uh, you guys also mentioned it, was that we were going to uh, keep the current programs uh, that you know is so that way if you're currently receiving benefits you get to choose um, between keeping these benefits or uh, or switching to UBI, which the this uh, if we're keeping these programs then still we're still going to have to pay for the bureaucracy that is in place to run these programs and uh, we're not going to get the savings of replacing programs with UBI, it's just going to be redundant and it's going to be very costly. Alrighty, now we have 10 minutes for Q&A, followed by five minutes each for closing statements, starting with the affirmative. Uh, so the first question is for the negative side. Um, you've made a lot out of the case for reforming existing welfare programs instead. Uh, in the past, what has success meant for welfare program reform, and what are some examples of successful reforms? Um, well, I don't really have any super specifics on welfare reforms, but I do want to say that welfare is a lot more flexible. Um, like I talked about before, is that it's, it has the ability to increase its spending and increase the amount of people that it can extend to or the amount that they're getting. Um, and my main argument is basically that instead of increasing spending on giving money to everybody. We, if we want to increase spending and reform a bit, we could increase that spending and give it to the people that need it the most and use it towards the programs that are targeted towards people like single parents who would, uh, single mothers who would end up being way worse off in a system like UBI. So uh, during the Great Depression and afterwards, the New Deal came about, and that was a huge um, government initiative to hire people for jobs, to hire the people directly, and not just give them money, but give them work to do, to build, um, to improve the country. And I think that's a huge uh, example of like welfare reform, because under like a UBI, they're just giving money and not a job. Um, there's, no, there's no other added um, 
protection against uh, depressions or recessions in financial hardship times because if people don't have a job but they just have money, um, then their life you know, has little meaning day to day. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I have uh, one question for the affirmative side. Uh, uh, you cited several examples uh, from your research about places where uh, universal basic income has been deployed, uh, either on a pilot basis or, in the case of Alaska, on a, a permanent uh, basis. I'd uh, be interested to know if there are other uh, examples of places where UBI has, has been in place uh, that you've learned about if you could share some more information about, about that. Thank you. Um, one example is Finland. Um, I don't believe we, we either mentioned it and didn't elaborate it or didn't elaborate at all. In 2017, Finland began a two-year experiment. It gave 2,000 unemployed people 560 euros a month for two years, even if they found work. Um, the recipient said it reduced stress. It also gave them more incentive to find a good job and to start their own business. Um, and the Finnish government um, was supposed to extend the trial uh, until 2018. Um, but um, that's, that's not happened yet. However, the time that Finland actually saw the effects of UBI, it was very successful. Um, and there are, I think, multiple other reasons that it's gotten stuck in the process of getting implemented again. Another um, um, example is um, Hawaii. Again, in 2017, the Hawaii state legislator passed a bill declaring that everyone is entitled to basic financial security. It directed the government to develop a solution, and um, speculation right now, um, based on recent sources, is that this probably includes a guaranteed income plan that would look very similar to UBI. Um, and then there is also Kenya. Um, universal basic income grants are being tested in the poor sector of Kenya. Um, and Welfare critics have long argued that the administrative costs um, are huge and provide limited positive results um, for the existing welfare programs in Kenya too, and it also discourages people from finding jobs. In response, leaders across the political spectrum have latched on to the idea of UBI for Kenya. Um, and yeah, um, should we find some more or? Oh, okay. Um, so we did before mention Alaska, but we didn't quite go into the specifics, which I thought would be good to do. So it's had a guaranteed income program since 1982 and has been giving their citizens um, a universal basic income since then. Um, it pays each resident an average of $1,200 a month um, from oil revenues. Um, and most save them for, save their money for emergencies. Um, it has had very good outcomes, um, received a lot of support from the people who receive it. Um, the Economic Security Project was launched to investigate UBI in Alaska and found that 79% of Alaskans agreed that the permanent fund dividend checks, which is what the program is called, permanent fund dividend, um, are an important source of income for people in their community. 72% 72 per, 72 support the fact that everyone who is basically a full-time resident of Alaska should receive the benefits. Um, and a very major and important thing is that a majority of Alaskans said that they would prefer the institution of a UBI, or they would prefer the institution of a state income tax over the termination of a UBI. So they would rather pay taxes than have UBI be terminated because they thought that it was that beneficial. Um, and the preference for keeping the PDF in response to our opponent's claims that it doesn't actually help low-income people, um, the preference for keeping it was actually strongest among those with annual household incomes under $500,000. Um, and those who de describe their situation as 
and I quote, barely surviving. Um, and yes, that is what I'd like to say about that. Oh, and also India is proposing to launch a UBI by 2022. So my question is going to be for the affirmative team. Uh, you're living right at the nexus of where politics meet the economics. So I just want to, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. You, hello. Um, so, so here's my question. We've talked a lot about the federal government. My question is about localities. In particular, two, as, two aspects. One. Is it going to be a flat income amount per resident in the United States? Will it differ by geography, understanding living conditions and things like that are vastly different? The second thing is you've proposed that a, num a lot of the savings will be from other programs. Won't that simply shift the cost burden to the states and the cities around the country who feel, still feel the need to provide that kind of service? That may be money, dedicated money, as it goes away, they're going to want to fill that gap. Um, one response to the, well, we don't claim to be experts in formulating policies for UBI, um, which is why we were constantly drawing from different proposals, but one um, approach that we think could um, be adopted is actually, we were just talking about Alaska. Alaska implemented their own UBI program within the state, so maybe the federal government could work with the state governments to establish parameters within which the UBI structure would be implemented. So that would essentially mean the state governments coming up with their own individual systems of how they think UBI could possibly work because Hawaii was doing that. Um, um, Alaska is, has been successfully doing it for so long, so that could be a possible solution to um, thinking about politics at the more local level as opposed to the federal level. And um, support for UBI has just been increasing over um, the past like decade, I think, um, and I think we talked about that a little bit before, and I'm assuming a lot of the support also comes from the political spheres. Um, so that's for the first question. Um, one of the things that we think is great about UBI and about federalism is that it allows states to create their own experiments for UBI based on the needs of their people and not, we're not recommending that the United States all of a sudden globally, or sorry, not globally, nationally, <laughs> um, implement a UBI because we think that that is unrealistic, but we do think that states, you know, state by state, um, should create programs for their constituencies um, that would be catered specifically to the people living in that state. Um, and as far as um, taking money away from other programs, um, the main thing that we are advocating for is not taking away money from programs uh, like social welfare programs, but rather putting taxes um, more heavily on wealthy people and corporations um, who have been benefiting and profiting from um, the exploitation of workers and also the automation, the rise of automation. Um, also, um, the reason that we had mentioned taking away money from the existing social welfare programs is um, like we think that, so this is another clarification for the team as well, we do not vouch for Andrew Yang's proposal, we were just using that as a template to talk about a few things because you brought it up in your introduction, but um, Andrew Yang's proposal says that um, people can have a choice between the existing welfare programs or switching to UBI. Um, Personally, um, and as a team, we do believe that maybe that's not the best approach to just giving people the option of doing that. But we also think that, as you mentioned, completely dismantling all the systems all of a sudden may lead to a backlash of sorts. So I think it would be um, finding an effective transition from maybe establishing like a two-year period where we're testing both UBI um, 
in like specific regions at the same time having a couple of welfare programs going to a transition just to UBI to decrease um, the cost of the program. So it would essentially be a type of transition um, that would be a balance between the existing welfare programs and implementing UBI. And as um, uh, Sophie mentioned, the money um, for UBI is not just coming from the dismantling of these systems, it's coming from a lot of other sources. Um, and according to um, the findings by the Roosevelt Institute, um, there we have more than enough money to finance something like this. And that finding has been taken up by a candidate like Andrew Yang. So. Thank you. Okay, so um, before I begin, I would just like to clarify that um, we believe that um, a UBI implementation would be easier um, as far as distribution of the money than welfare programs. Um, I don't think that um, giving money to everyone would be more difficult than finding specifically impoverished people to give money to, and also as far as um, who qualifies and that sort of thing. Um, the concept of universal basic income um, has been supported worldwide, not just now, but historically too. Thomas Paine outlined his idea for a basic income as early as 19, or 1797. Martin Luther King Jr. said that, I am now convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed measure, the guaranteed income. Rutger Bregman expressed his support by saying that basic income would give people the most important freedom, the freedom of deciding for themselves what they want to do with their lives. The idea of the American dream isn't really fulfilled until each and every person in this country has access to a means that can help them realize their ambitions. It is unjust that some people have the ability to dream big while others find themselves struggling to prov provide for themselves and their families. The idea of establishing a universal basic income in the United States is no longer a utopian dream. It's a political reality. Of course, today's political destabilization produces deep anxiety and indecisions, and poor decisions on the part of our current political leadership has caused real suffering in the lives of real people. But in one respect, our political era is liberating. These are all real conversations today, and they are all radical ideas that embrace the concept that we as a society are able to solve big problems. While its opponents may say that UBI in the United States is not feasible, both economically and politically, it is important to remember that it has worked in the United States before. Alaska's permanent fund dividend has worked to give monthly cash stipends to Alaskans since the early 1980s, and it has continuously received praise from Alaskan citizens and its ability to provide low-income adults who are barely surviving with an important source of income. Additionally, research conducted by University of Chicago professor Damon Jones and University of Pennsylvania professor Iowana Marinescu has shown that the public fund dividend has not had a negative impact on unemployment in Alaska and has helped to keep income inequality in Alaska among the lowest in the country. Studies by the Roosevelt Institute have shown that the increased spending caused by the implementation of a UBI would have a positive effect on the economy, creating 4.6 million jobs and growing the economy by 12% continuously. Additionally, in the United States as a whole, implementing UBI is becoming more and more popular. Um, uh, one clarification that we would also like to offer is I think, I believe that you said that it is a weak argument to say that it removes the um, that uh, giving UBI to everyone removes the incentive for certain people to live in certain income backgrounds. That essentially means that, that, that by saying that, you're essentially saying that it is okay for people to live in lower income brackets because what giving UBI to everyone means is that they can move up in the social spectrum and in their income bracket and still receive a payment until they're able to keep themselves on their feet. Um, and another clarification is that you said that carbon tax money should go to climate change. Um, the fact is that because of 
the structural inequalities that we are talking about, there are specific communities and groups of people who are more negatively impacted by um, global climate change and um, or global warming. Um, and giving these people a universal basic income gives them the access to actually give themselves a little bit more privilege to move out of the of this trap where they are more negatively impacted than other people in the community. Um, uh, so. Uh, in the United States as a whole, implementing a universal basic income is becoming more and more popular with public support for UBI quadrupling over the past decade as Americans see the effect of stagnant wages and rise in income inequality. Today, the United States is the 30th percentile of income inequality globally, with the top 0.1% making 188 times the income of the bottom 99%. 40.6 million people live in poverty and 95 million live close to poverty. UBI equalizing the playing field, equalizes the playing field and it does so by placing higher taxes on corporations and the massively wealthy who have created the conditions for the levels of poverty that we see in the country today. UBI gives low-income mothers the ability to stay home with their newborn baby instead of having to immediately return to work, an option today that is only affordable to middle and upper-class women. It helps veterans who are struggling to integrate back into their lives after returning from combat. It helps new college graduates enter into the job market and cope with their burgeoning student loan debt. Um, the opposition raises issues that must be taken into account while deliberating these issues because we must have mechanisms that are fair and practical. At the end of the day, we all want to live in a country that is economically equally liberating for all. And to achieve that goal, universal basic income is the safety net for the future that we need. Thank you. Hello, I would like to thank everybody for coming out and being here to see us participate in the debate and for lasting this long and staying with us. Um, so, to begin, the assumptions that the believers of UBI assert to be true in order to make their claim are simply not facts. Not only are the foundation, foundational assumptions wrong, but every other stage of this idea collapses due to idealized beliefs. There is no practical implementation for a society shift of this scale. We all want a greater world. We all want citizens to be happy and healthy. It's just not a reasonable solution. Universal basic income will not improve America's political or social economy because of insufficient means of implementation and insufficient means of cost. Welfare provided by the state does not have to be universal. There are many citizens who have the means to provide for themselves and their family without government assistance. There are many people who are well above the line of needing assistance, and an extra $1,000 a month does little to them. But that $1,000 might not be enough for some people who are in need of assistance. Any of the plans mentioned um, by the affirmative team did not mention family care um, assistance. People with uh, young children will need more money to raise them. The welfare system in place today and universal basic income are not mutually exclusive. It is not one or the other. Milton Friedman's negative uh, tax, income tax, that was mentioned by the affirm uh, affirmative, is another example of a basic income, but it is not universal. That is what we are, um, one of our main arguments, that it does not have to be a universal income. Any of the pilot programs mentioned uh, by the affirmative are also poor examples of UBI. None of the studies had a true universal income. In Alaska, the money given out to the, the citizens was from oil revenues. Now that's something that's not applicable to all states. Florida doesn't have any oil to, to make money to give to their citizens, nor will, will, will it have in the future with the changing ideas about energy. The affirmative team had three main arguments tonight or this afternoon, uh, that universal income will be paid for by tax changes that will not be detrimental to society, that UBI will help people get jobs and close the inequality gap, and that programs in place today are more of a hassle than a benefit. The first is false because not everyone in this country believes in increasing the federal debt. The affirmative said that they are not taking away programs necessarily because they did not outline a single one. 
However, many of the UBI programs do advocate for taking away all welfare programs. Um, and adding the income, so if we did keep both programs, the universal basic income and welfare programs, that would just double the cost of welfare and we would have to pay an exponentially amount of taxes. The second is false, because while we are not debating the morality of people um, getting the benefits and if they're spending money wisely and look for work, there is no guarantee of an employment. If automation of unskilled labor is taking over, then there should be more defined training programs. If a UBI gets rid of some programs, then there will be a greater power vacuum that would allow private companies to take over that space. Medicare, job training, groceries, and agriculture. And the third may be true. We're not saying that our welfare system today is perfect. Universal basic income can be thought of in two different ways, as a model and as a policy. When looking at it as a mod model, the assumptions that need to be made are that the government has a reliable way to reach every person that people are rational actors, and that consumption behaviors do not change due to increases in taxes. From these assumptions, it is easy to come to the conclusion that a UBI would result in an increase in aggregate demand and expand the economy. And um, that, we think, is the best thing to happen to our country. Uh, employment, labor forces, participation in prices will go up due to the increase in the demand. And now that is all true if you follow a post-neo or new Keynesian idea of thought, which I know many do in this room. UBI might be a vision of how our society should look, but it is not a tool to get us there. Thank you. First of all, we've been doing this, I think, for 10 or 12 years, and it's always outstanding to come back as an alum and see such well-prepared well and interested students. It's great. Um, you know, having been uh, a debater for the university back to 1,000 years ago, um, I do appreciate the discipline that's required in putting this on top of other academic activities. Um, both sides made some very cogent arguments. I thought both summaries, we thought both summaries were both very good and strong. And so good work, and I'd like to just round of applause for both teams. That said, in the final analysis, and it was a very close call, um, we feel the affirmative made a slightly stronger case, and so they are the winner of the debate. Congratulations. Hello, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, welcome to the second phase of the um of our undergraduate, uh, economics undergraduate celebration. Let me remind you, if you haven't had a chance to look, uh, there's a poster session in the uh, atrium of Gordon Hall of this building where you can see the work that the economics undergraduate research assistants have been engaged in working closely with faculty members over the past uh, semester. That will be on display until the end of the evening. Uh, we've just completed the undergraduate economics uh, club uh, sponsored debate and um, this is the award ceremony, which will be followed by dinner. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. Um, we're going to honor students who have done extraordinary work over their time here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I think before we get started, perhaps we can have a round of applause for the many parents, friends, supporters, and family who have uh, made possible uh, your, your achievements. And we'll, we'll do that again. <laughs> So I will, uh, read, uh, I will read the name of the, uh, the award. I will announce the award winner. Please come up and you'll receive a, uh, a certificate and uh, we'll get a picture of you. So um, for awards where there's more than one winner, we'll bring you up uh, one, one at a time so we can do that. The first award, uh, it's my pleasure to present, is the Economics Alumni Award for Distinguished Service. The Economics Alumni Advisory Board, which is well represented here by our, by, by our judges, is a group of alumni who have uh, shown special dedication to the department and offer their time and insight and experience to making the, exper to making the uh, experience that our students have a, a richer one, a more fulfilling one, and one that connects them rapidly to the world beyond UMass. We're very grateful to the alumni award, uh, to the alumni board. 
The Alumni Advisory Board uh, gives the uh, alum award, Alumni Award for Distinguished Service to students who have contributed extensively to the UMass Amherst uh, community, particularly to the community in the Department of Economics. And it is my pleasure to, uh, to announce the first of two awards. Michael Carvalho is the uh, award winner. The second, uh, um, the second award, uh, Economics Alumni Award for Distinguished Service, goes to Antonia Morini, um, who did a wonderful job uh, at moderating the debate. Next award is also given by the Economics Alumni Advisory Board. It is the Economics Alumni Award for Outstanding Achievement. This is granted by the uh, advisory board to a student who has demonstrated outstanding achievement, both academically and for service to the university or the community. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to announce the uh, Economics Alumni Award for Outstanding Achievement. Uh, it is for Dennis McAuliffe. Is Dennis here? The next award is the Economics Writing Award. This award is presented to the student who has written the best paper in economics in the past, in, 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 recent, in, in recent years. Um, the, uh, the writing award is nominated by faculty, and it's my pleasure to recognize first the faculty nominator of this year's award. It's my colleague, Carol Heim, who is with us here. And the, <laughs> And the award for a really exceptional paper, which uh, the uh, uh, award committee had an opportunity to read, uh, was on uh, Ha Jun Chang's uh, kick, kicking out, kicking out, pulling up the ladder. Um, a, a, a extremely well-written essay, and John, Jonathan John Bloom was the author of that paper. I enjoyed reading it a lot. So. The E.W. Eldridge Jr. Memorial Endowment was established in 1966 for the purpose of awarding scholarships to worthy and exceptional economics students. And it's my pleasure to announce the uh, E.W. Eldridge Jr. Memorial Scholarship winner uh, for 2019 is Brad Palumbo. Is, is Brad here? So I will. The Finnegan Family Scholarship was established for economics majors with strong academic standing. It was made possible by uh, the generous donation of Deborah Finnegan, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Hamlin Capital Management. She is also the mother of economics graduate Stephen Hunter Finnegan, who graduated in 2016. So um, this is a, a, a new and very generous award. Uh, and it's my pleasure to announce the winner is Neil Patel. who was my student in the fall. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, in honor, in honor. So. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, really well done. It's So a very important part of the undergraduate experience at UMass is engaging in co-curricular, extracurricular activity that helps build, uh, build students as, as citizens, as thinkers, um, as, uh, helps them build careers. And that is often done through internships. And not all internships are paid. There's a, uh, there's a saying, interns built the pyramids, uh, which some of you may have heard. Um, so, but many internships do impart valuable skills, uh, even if they are unpaid. And we want to make it possible for all students, regardless of background, 
uh, to, um, to 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 un undertake uh, to undertake uh, inter internships. So we're we're grateful to F. Ward McCarthy, class of '73, for endowing the F. Ward McCarthy Scholarship for Interns. It's presented to two students who who have or will be completing an unpaid internship during this calendar year, and we're we're deeply grateful for that kind of support that makes it possible to uh, to expand horizons through um, through taking an internship, which while unpaid may be of enormous value to the student going forward. So we have um, we have two uh, uh, F. Ward McCarthy scholars. It's my pleasure to introduce them. The first is Dunya Mahmoud. Is Dunya here, please? Yes. The second F. Ward McCarthy scholarship uh, winner is Ryan Saul. Is Ryan here, please? The next award is the Highest Academic Achievement Award. This award is, pre this award is presented to, a, to a, a junior or senior with a top GPA within the major. And it's my pleasure to introduce, to, to welcome, welcome up, Trace Dodge. <laughs> who also was the first to note that I sent the wrong date for this. I sent around, um, I got Thursday right, but I said, um, I said April 23rd, and Trace wrote back instantly, saying, I think you mean the 25th, so I'm grateful. Uh, great, great. A, a keen eye is the path to, uh, the, congratulations. Thank you. So, please look at the camera. It is now my pleasure to announce uh, the Hubby Scholarships. This scholarship was established for economics majors with strong academic standing, and it was made possible by the generous donation of John and Deborah Hubby. John Hubby, class of 84, is a partner at KPMG in, in New York City. So we'll have nine Hubby awardees. I think it would be nice if you each came up here and then we took a picture. We'll, we'll award each of you, and then we'll get a picture of all of you, which I think would, 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 would be very nice. So. Um, let me introduce the, uh, the awardees one at a time. Asonganyi Amin Mense is the first uh, hubby award winner who wrote to me and said that she will not be able to be here today. So we can, in, in absentia. <laughs> Matthew Berry. <laughs> Emily Brunelli. Bryce Cole. I can stack the. Do you want to No, Bryce is here. Oh, Emily Oh, this is. Sorry, you were. Bryce. Bryce. Bryce Cole. For a moment, uh, if, you, if you want to have a seat, please. Sit. Carmine Fatsi. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Hack, who, who wrote to me, who is not able to be here. Jack Howard. <laughs> Brian Nguyen. And Sydney Ternulo. Is Sydney here? Okay. So we could grab a group shot of yeah. the Hubby uh, winners. Mm -hmm. I will. Mm -hmm.
The Jacqueline Dorfman Scholarship supports students studying economics who have a strong academic standing. It was made possible by the generous donation of Jacqueline Dorfman, class of 1982. And the awardee is Selena Kwan. colleague. The James Kindle Award, this is, this is Jim Kindle, um, who had retired before I arrived and passed not long after I, uh, I, I joined UMass. Um, I think he passed in 2003, is it? Is that, is that right, Carol? I think that's 2003? Is that no? This prize is awarded to an economic student with a commitment to social issues or public policy concerns, strong writing skills, or a record of excellence in economic history. These are all things that were important to Professor James Kindle, whom the prize honors. Professor Kindle taught in the economics department from 1967 until 1998, when he retired. In addition to teaching, Jim served as department chair for three years and as undergraduate program director for many years. Professor Kindle passed away in 2003, and this award was established in his memory. And it's my honor to uh, announce the uh, 2019 Kindle Award winner is Yasmin Idemi. Is, is Yasmin here? We will, hold, we will hold the certificate. The Lisa B. and John C. DeForge Scholarship um, was created in memory of Keith R. Friedman, who was the brother of Lisa DeForge. I, let me remark that Lisa DeForge was very active on the economics alum board. She was class of 87 and a terrific, terrific supporter of the department in many, many ways. This scholarship, not least among those, but, but someone who is, who is really a wonderful supporter of the department. Um, the award is in honor, is in memory of her brother, uh, who had a uh, strong, lifelong interest in the arts. And so the scholarship is designed to support an economics major who has strong economic standing and also has a demonstrated interest in the arts. So that's a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting um, uh, un union, and, and some, some good things will come out of that. The Lisa B. and John C. DeForge Scholarship awardee this year is Greta Gaffin. It's Greta here. <laughs> The Rosemary Hussey Werrett Scholarships were made possible by the generous donation of Rosemary Hussey Werrett, class of 1962, who traveled the world in her careers as journalist and economic analyst. This scholarship was established for economics ma majors with strong academic standing, especially those studying international economics and the role of women in the global economy. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce, there are two, uh, there are two uh, Ro Rosemary Hussey Warrett scholarships. The first is awarded to Bianca Yeem. Is Bianca here? <laughs> we'll, we'll honor her in attention. And the second, I, I, I received an email, so I know that she is not here. Uh, she's studi studying abroad, studying international economics. <laughs> is, is, Isabel Tomino is, uh, is, the, uh, is the other award. <laughs> The Sherry Barber Memorial Scholarships are supported by a fund established in honor of Sherry Barber. It provides tuition support to economics students. Sherry Barber graduated from the economics department in 1943 and helped to establish minimum wages across the country. So you can see that work remains important to this day while earning a master's degree in economics from Harvard and a law degree from Boston College. So. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, Sherry Barber Memorial Scholarship awardees. There, there are four, and I hope we can take a, a, a group picture. The first is Victoria Abramchuk. Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Can you wait and we'll take a picture together? Great, thanks. The second is George Armstrong. The third Sherry Barber Memorial Scholarship winner this year is Michael Carvalho. Wait just a moment, we'll take a picture together. And the fourth is Peter Gao. Is Peter here? Congratulations. Uh, it really is. So if we could take a picture yeah. of our... Um, Okay, we will now, um, we, we, so we will now uh, bring up, uh, I think, some groups, or should we bring up groups? Or should we bring up the groups? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so we are now going to have several, we, we, th so that, that ends our award of scholarships. We're now going to have some recognition of high achievement in the department. I think we'll bring you up in groups and take, take group pictures. So the next, so we, the department would like to recognize, the department has a very important partnership with the neighboring Food Co-op Association and the Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives. We offer one of very few uh, trainings in the United States for undergraduates on operating cooperative enterprises, understanding the economic challenges that face a different mode of organizing a productive, a productive enterprise. It is neither a nonprofit, uh, nor is it government, nor is it a, nor is it a, 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 proprietor, a proprietor or share Shareholder corporation. It is a cooperative enterprise that is both owned, that is owned and 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 operated by its worker by its worker owners. Um, in order to train people, we've developed an undergraduate certificate in applied economic research on cooperative enterprise. We do this in collaboration with the two organizations I mentioned, uh, the Neighboring Food Co-op Association and VOC, the Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives. There is a very rigorous certificate program that, require, that includes a very demanding internship where students rotate through a number of cooperative enterprises as a worker experiencing what it means to work in a co-op, and then in the classroom, learn to analyze what are the challenges facing, facing, uh, co uh, facing cooperatives. So I'd like to bring up uh, the, uh, the, uh, those who are receiving the certificate this year, um, and I'll, I will read their names and let us recognize them. Sancha Kakar is one. <laughs> Jacob Latora. Mark Maren. Nicholas Monica. Antonia Morini. Emily Seleski. And Kyle Stefanides. Let me, so. Let me also mention that you can learn more about the work done by, uh, done by uh, these en enterpri enterprising uh, young people um, in, about an hour, in about one hour. Um, is that? In about one hour, uh, there will be presentations of their experience in the Cooperative Enterprise Program. Um, that will be held in Crotty Hall, in Crotty 20. 
209 and Karate 209. So uh, I'd like to congratulate um, all of you for participating in this award. I'd like to take a picture with you if I, if I, if I, if I may. Okay. 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 So the economics department is home to many, uh, to ma to many outstanding students uh, on campus, uh, some of whom uh, have been elected to, uh, honor, to, to uh, honor societies. So I'd like to recognize those students who have been elected to Phi Beta Kappa and to Phi Kappa Phi, uh, which are two of the most prominent uh, na uh, na uh, national or international academic honor, so uh, honor societies. So I'll again ask you to come up. I will read a, a list of names and we'll take a picture together. The first, so the Phi Beta Kappa Induct, um, uh, inductees are Jennifer Aguiar, <laughs> Connor Bond, <laughs> Dennis McAuliffe, <laughs> Brad Palumbo, <laughs> and Ryan Saul. We would now like to recognize those students. Uh, we'd like to commend the following students who, uh, for their uh, extraordinary work in the honors program over their years at UMass. So, um, so, so this, this is congratulations for our, uh, for our uh, primary and secondary majors in economics who um, have been working in the honors college and uh, are on their, way, on their way to honors. So I, again, I will call the names. If you'll please come up, um, we will uh, recognize you as, as a group. So Kevin Chambers. Jack Cohn, John Duran, Jonah Greenfield, Cooper Heilman, Adrian Hoopin, James Jedris. Raquel Kidu, <laughs> Ethan Lazar, <laughs> Danica Manalo, <laughs> Dennis McAuliffe, Amazing. Brad Palumbo, <laughs> Eric Sandok, <laughs> John Scahill. We, we, we will also, and please, please say, we will also recognize our secondary majors in, econ our secondary majors in economics who, will, who are on their way to honors. Maxwell Ball, <laughs> James Barvik, please hold applause, I'll, I'll read the names and uh, we can. John Blatchford, Jack Congdon, Ryan Dahlgren, Akshay Delity. Jacqueline Hayes, Brandon Klein, Robert Komarovsky, Jonathan Maciel, Zachary McLean, Nicholas Monica, Asiri Murul Lidar, Taylor O'Dell, Ari Silverfine, Olivia Sparks, Alexander St Stasis, Rowan Steer, Stephen Ulick, Rene Varte Vartabedian, Mackenzie Webb, and Alexander Alexandra Zuharas. So we have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
Thanks. And again, these achievements would not be possible without the uh, enormous and generous support of um, many families, friends, supporters. Uh, and so I hope that we can once again recognize those who have made possible the achievements of, of our outstanding students. Thank you.